excuse me so so it's live all right delightful hey hi hello welcome or welcome back to my channel my name is jess and today i have a lovely guest heidi and we um i read medical apartheid during nonfiction november which is a chunky nonfiction here I had a lot of thoughts, obviously, <laughs> really great book. And yeah, so we're gonna have a chat about it here and I'll let Heidi introduce herself and tell her what, what brought you to wanting to having this conversation. So what yeah. do you do in your line of work? So I have two jobs, basically, <laughs> that happened by accident. Hello, millennial status. Oh. Um, so my main job that like, you know, pays the bills and stuff and I do all day, every day, is I'm a researcher. Um, and my research is focused on clinical trial methods. So I did a PhD in clinical trial recruitment, which is like the nichest of the niche. <laughs> um, <laughs> how to put people into trials, how to make them, how to make sure that they're happy with the setup and all that kind of thing, and what the evidence that we currently have looks like. Um, and I graduated from that about three years ago. Um, and now my main gig is essentially like research into inclusivity in trials. So how to make sure that the participant populations that we have look like the world, because at the moment they tend to look like middle-aged, middle-class white guys, mm -hmm. like I don't know, <laughs> some other industries. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's my kind of my main thing, um, doing a lot of work around ethnicity and socioeconomic dep deprivation and rural communities and that kind of thing. Um, and then my second job, hobby thing, side gig, <laughs> is um, I have a little business called Little Science Co. Um, and that is essentially like a creative outlet for me. So I make and design stuff that uh, shows that science is inclusive and that science is for everyone. That is awesome. I didn't realize a PhD. Whew. PhD. I'm always impressed I'm and humbled. And <laughs> like I just, I like to go look at the websites of like PhD programs and masters, and I'm like, no, <laughs> just, no, not for me. <laughs> I, I look at the time, I'm like, ooh, about that. So that yeah. is impressive. That is very fitting for this book, though. Is do you like your main line of work? Yeah, I love it. I think a lot of people, when I started the business on the side, everyone was like, oh, she's setting up to leave. Mm -hmm. and I was like, no, I'm just, this is just another thing I have. <laughs> like, it's not, yeah. um, it's not an either or for me. I, I love both. And the main, my main passion is, is like my day job. So it's, it fits really well. Um, and this book had been recommended to me by, I don't know, hundreds of people probably <laughs> at some point, yeah. like various colleagues and like, people I follow online had recommended it and that kind of thing. And I was just like, it's huge. And the text's really small and I'm scared of it. And I don't, I'm not going to read it. And then I saw you were reading it and I was like, this is a good excuse. If yes. I have a deadline, then I'll actually do it. <laughs> so you were my self-imposed deadline. It was great. I'm proud. Yeah, they can be, <laughs> could be very, I remember being like, oh, it's not that. And then I looked at the words. I'm like, oh, it has, it's quite long, but it is really good. This So this book is Medical Apartheid. The subtext or subtitle is The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans from Colonial Times to the Present by Harriet A. Washington. Um, it was published, I think, in 2006. Yeah. But still, I mean, a lot of it, if it doesn't, even if it doesn't include recent things, can still be applied to a lot of things. So from reading this, and you are in the UK, in Scotland, I am indeed, yeah, I'm in Scotland. And I'm obviously from America. So what, did you still find this useful, like reading this book? Yeah, definitely. Um, so there were parts of the book that I knew about, but like not enough, <laughs> um, <laughs> not enough for, that I should have known about basically. And the more I was opening it up, I was like, oh man, oh, that makes sense. Like that makes sense as to why we're here. Mm -hmm. And when we're having conversations, particularly with the work that I'm doing at the minute, we're talking about like, why trials currently aren't for everyone, why they're basically just middle class, you know, well off um, white people. Mm -hmm. Why is that currently happening? And then there's a few examples of like uh, past abuse and things come up, but they, t they tend to be like throwaway comments like, oh, they're hard to, like this group are hard to engage. And you're like, have you tried to speak to them? Are they hard yeah. to engage or have you just not engaged? Mm -hmm. You're like, I feel um, like there's a little yeah. more there. But yeah, I feel like maybe you're putting the blame on someone that is not you, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So it comes up a lot, like all of these little ideas that contribute to what the position that we're in now. And then when I read the book, I was like, oh man, okay, so we all need to just read this at the start of every job that we ever do. Like mm-hmm. yeah. every medical professional, every health researcher should like, this should just be required reading before you even start work because it just explains so much. And it means that we're not going into situations like with an arrogance that we don't deserve, mm-hmm. basically, which I think is what what most medical and health professionals are probably doing at the moment. Yeah. I, I'm not in the medical field. I mean, I have an undergrad in like public health, which is very general, but I felt the same way finishing. I'm like, this needs to be like a required text for anyone really in any kind of medical pr- profession, especially when you're directly dealing with patients. Um, and I, so Andrew, my husband was having a small hospital procedure. So I was reading this while I was waiting for him. And the, one of the nurses came in and asked me what I was reading. And he was like, oh, that must be required for school. I'm like, no, it's just my leisurely reading. And he was like, oh, I'd never <laughs> no, heard of it. Just, like, you know, keeping like, myself in the gut multiple times. You know, just something cozy to, <laughs> to read. And he had never yeah. heard of it. And I'm like, but, um, yeah, I just thought that was interesting because obviously this is from an American perspective, but they're, you know, the UK is our like our parent and then the US is the baby that got emancipated <laughs> very young. So I feel like things can definitely translate. Um, so when in your work, I was curious, do you with studies, are you studying how to get more people or do you actually like help people set up studies or? So it's a bit of both. So because I'm so like, like I'm baby in my career at the minute that I'm kind of the one that's doing like little research projects and trying to think of ways to help Mm -hmm. and waiting to be invited into the room to actually help, you know? (laughs) Um, So one of the projects that I'm doing at the minute, like is so relevant to this was um, I got like my first funding as a, like my own investigator kind of grant. And it's, it's a really small pot of money, but it meant that we could, there's a group of, I think, maybe seven or eight of us researchers from um, across the UK, um, basically figuring out what the evidence at the moment shows as to how people from minority ethnic groups experience trials. So is it like they feel othered? Is it that people, like the health professionals, just don't even approach them to take part in a trial? Like, what's the situation as to why recruitment is so bad, basically? Mm-hmm. Um, and that, like the whole way through doing that piece of work I was like oh this book like can we just re- can we just base the whole thing on, like just, just put this in like that's the final <laughs> report of the whole study yeah. um but yeah in the UK like the situation is oh, I don't want to say it's the same but it, it's so similar to what the US situation is and that like we don't we don't look at research as like a sort of geographic location thing so Mm -hmm. there's so much research that's been done in the US that is being used in the UK and you're like why are we not looking at the US history then like why are we not yeah taking a bit of a breath and step back and being like okay this is this is what happened this is how they got to this situation we're in the same situation now how do we stop it from getting as bad I guess yeah Um, so yeah, I'm not in the room where trials are being designed at the minute, but hopefully some of the work that I've done might be in conversations in that room, even if I'm I not. Hope so. Yeah, I hope so. I think you, you're you obviously, when thinking and like wanting to read this, I think that's already a huge step in trying to look outside of just probably the immediate knowledge or like what else everyone else has done, because obviously trials are necessary, even if a lot of us would be like, mm, I don't know if I, I want to yeah. be in one, but they are, you know, necessary for science to progress. But I think, and she touched on this a lot in the book with informed consent and yeah. not just telling someone and being like, okay, sign here, but really making sure they fully understand it. And I mean, as a, I feel like I'm decently read and I can't imagine, like I've tried to read like, you know, like scientific papers and stuff and those can be complicated. So I can't imagine a normal lay person or even maybe a person who isn't as educated because obviously this starts back in colonial times and she talks a lot about like <clears throat> prisoners. So maybe people who yeah. don't have an education and you're just like, oh yeah, we're just going to test out this lotion. No problem. You just put it on and no big deal. And they're like, oh, and they're like, oh, well, you know, you may get out of jail earlier or, or make more money. Okay. Yeah. But they don't say, oh, we haven't tested these chemicals before or all of 
So, uh, yeah, I just love how much I was touching the mic. Like, I, just... I mean, like yeah. I knew, like you said, I knew some things, but I didn't know, I didn't know most things. And so that informed consent, I think, can be mis, uh, mistaken as just, I told them, but it's like, yeah. did they understand? Did you, did you keep them up to date? Um, yeah, because it's not like, as like a as a flip side so when we're doing informed consent training so like in the uk there's well in across the world there's training that we have to do as researchers to be able to take informed consent from someone mm -hmm. um and that's called gcp so it's good clinical practice and that basically came in like probably after the war because of all of the crap that went on with like experimentation on people in concentration camps and that kind of thing mm -hmm. and it was essentially like okay we need to bring some principles together and for everyone to adhere to these guidelines to make sure it doesn't happen again. But obviously there's race in that as well, because this had been happening for hundreds of years with African-Americans, with black people around the world. And yet suddenly there's white people in concentration camps. And, and that's, that's, that's the ticket where you're like, Oh, actually that's the bad bit. Now we have to do something about it. Yeah. Wild. Anyway, it usually, yeah. It takes once it's happening, um, to the white population for them to be like, oh, yeah. maybe this isn't good. I found it interesting, especially in like the colonial times or slavery times in America, she was talking about how they did so many practices on black people. And then once they perfected it, would do the you know procedure. So I'm like, I just find that interesting. Like their body isn't worthy of, you know, being treated equally or all these things so you can experiment and then be like, okay, now I got it now. Um, now, now we'll try it on like people. Barbara down the street. Like, yeah, after now you and you know, we ruined your life and I'm gonna destroy the crazy. evidence. <laughs> like that, the, the way that the logic worked in it was just like the mental gymnastics was just kind of astounding. Like, so we're gonna test things on the black body because they don't feel pain. Like, obviously I don't believe that, but that, that was the excuse. Yeah. You know, the bodies are different. They're animalistic in some way and then you move forward a bit and you get forward to like anatomy studies and people at universities that need bodies to do dissections on and suddenly they're the perfect dudes and you're like wait what you said that we were different why do you want yeah. to then have them as the medical model that you're working on like what do you make yeah. it make sense like it doesn't yeah. so many of my notes are like how does this make sense so like <laughs> literally you're you're contradicting yourself <laughs> with what you're saying i found the uh, the dissection I, I feel bad saying like i enjoyed this book it's fascinating because i feel like that's weird to say yeah. but i had previously um heard or when i was reading books about like forensic anthropology about the uh, I can't think of their names, two men in like Scotland, like the 1800s who are like taking bodies or something. Oh, like the body snatchers. And yeah. yeah. And then I'm, so I'd heard of that before. And so I don't know why I didn't think that existed in the United States, but reading about that um, and how they would use like black men to, to, you know, rob the graves of black people to get bodies for dissection. And it was just like, like, it's important, obviously, for them to have cadavers. Like, that's not the issue. It's like, there was a quote, I think, um, about, where was it? Um, she said, for Blacks, anatomical dissection meant even more. It was an extension of slavery into eternity because it represented a profound level of white control over their bodies, illustrating that they were not free even in death, um, which I thought was, I was yeah. like, ooh because she had some examples of like Addie Mae Collins, which was one of the, during the civil rights movement, <clears throat> that was years old. later, yeah. her family went to move her, her coffin, it was empty. Or that uh, Medical University of Georgia or whatever, how they found like hundreds or thousands of bones. Yeah, um, just like strewn around in, in with like the glassware. Yeah, like, oh, oh, just a femur, throw it down there. It's just so oh. much history and especially obviously i'm an american that i would never have learned had i not read this like there's just so much that we 
we don't get. And so this may be, I feel like this may be an odd question, but obviously race is like a really prominent topic in the, the media. Do you, and I know a lot of people, <laughs> there's kind of a conversation of, is the America the worst place to go? Or like, we're seeing stuff from the UK. Have you ever visited America? Yeah, so I've been to the States a few times. Um, I actually did an internship when I was, was it like third year of uni, I think? Um, at Princeton, a lot of the university, it was at a, a bio, biotech company. So I was there for like a whole summer. Okay. Um, I did like a summer at Camp America in my first summer of uni and that kind of thing. So I've been over it like a decent amount of time. And to me, the problems are the same. It's just that we don't, we're not as vocal about it because because mm-hmm. it's much easier for like the British. So like British people, you'll know this from just like memes and shit online, but like <laughs> people will do anything for a quiet life anything mm-hmm. if we can possibly say oh it's worse in america then it means that we don't even have to like question the issue that we have because you know it's worse over there and so it's better and it's the same with even like our healthcare system like yes the nhs our national health service is in trouble but hey it's not america right and you're like just because it's potentially worse there doesn't mean it's not bad here like it's yeah. not like think about it put your brain into into gear and like actually think about what is happening because in in the UK we have a hugely diverse population but I think most of the white population at least think we're less diverse than we actually are because yeah. it's just easier to be like no nah, you know they have the US has got loads of racism and that's really bad isn't that terrible Full stop. Move right. on. Like, get on we're with your life. Like, oh, hmm. Not us yeah. though. We're <laughs> over here across the pond. We're just fine. Yeah. There's so many commute. I've been to like London and around um, a few times, and there's so many, just so many different communities and areas yeah. and people. You know, and a lot of people immigrate to the UK, and so it's always just interesting when I see things like that on the news or like. I'm like, it is, I mean, we're not to be rude, but where white people exist, there's racism. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, just, really yeah, just, yeah, like there's going to be, there's going to be a group of people that are going to like segregate based on skin color because that's what humanity has done. Like, yeah. we're sorry, but we're just inherently terrible <laughs> as humans. <laughs> like, this is what we're going to do. There's an opportunity to find a difference. And if you can find the difference and it's, you can see it, that's what that's what they do and it's yeah. obvious and it, it takes work for someone to try and like get out of that psyche and I think our younger generation are doing a really good job with that and like you can see really positive things online and stuff but yeah like even I live in a really small like suburb outside of Aberdeen city so Aberdeen is like northeast Scotland mm-hmm. really far north it's cold here like it's cold <laughs> um and people are like oh Aberdeen's not diverse at all and you're like we're an oil city. We, of, of course, we're diverse. There's money here. <laughs> like, yeah, of course we're diverse because there's jobs here. So that's what happens. So we have a massive Nigerian community, particularly because of the oil, because there's oil stuff in Nigeria. And so people can move more easily with employers and stuff. Um, huge Asian community, like lots of Chinese supermarkets and enclaves of the, of the city that are diverse in that way. And then you get into the suburbs and everyone's like, Mm-mm, not diverse at all. No, 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 no. All, you know, white picket fence, lovely, lovely white people here. And then like, so one example of that would be, I have, there's a local Facebook group as like loads of communities have. Um, and I got kicked out of ours because I called some people out for being racist. <laughs> Apparently they don't like to hear that. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> So I got blocked from that group because I'd been like, like when the Black Lives Matter stuff was flaring up in the UK um, after George Floyd was murdered. And I'd said, look, there's nothing on this page about anything. Like, can we do something? Uh, Can we get in touch with our local schools and make sure there's like black history on the curriculum and that kind of thing? And everyone was like, this is not our issue. This is an American issue. It's just like snowflakes in the UK are basically, you know, tapping onto this and being like, let's just, you know, shout about something and whinge about something because that's what the young people do these days. Mm. Ah. You're like, okay. Okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's the, the downside, I think, there. And 
well, I say here, I speak for America when I say here, <laughs> but um, is yes, there is progress with the younger generation, but so much of the older generation is still in power and will be for a while that are making all of these decisions and or laws. And it's just so frustrating because you're like, what do I, I'm not even in the, you know, I'm not Gen Z, but it's still in this middle part where it's like, sure, technically I'm old enough to run for office or all these things, but it's like, at least in the U.S., I know our political system is very much run by money. So it's yeah. like, I, I don't know what, I don't know what you want us to do, but yeah. yeah so how do you find it different between like the U.S. and where you are now in Europe? Like, is there a difference for you? Do you feel, I don't know, I, less? Like, do you feel safer here? I kind of and. So I live on the military base, so I think that helps. But just in general, knowing that the general population can't just buy guns willy nilly, you know. So I'm yeah. like, you know, <laughs> that's great there. <laughs> that um, right. yeah. <laughs> so I should have learned Italian, and I know the barest minimum to get by. So that can be. I've heard I haven't had to like seek medical care here besides like routine things, and so I with insurance i just have to go to the base but i've talked to people who've gone there's been mixed feedback from experiences out um what they call out in town or on the economy which is just the local italian community or sicilian and then on base um and so it's kind of mixed because you just hear about different experiences where people when we talk about in the u.s are always like you want to be like canada or all these socialist countries and you have to have all these long waits and it's like well you know what? i wait in America too, or I do all these things. Um, so I've heard like good and bad out there, but I don't have any firsthand experience on like medical, but just race in general, I feel, I mean the same, maybe a little less. I have had some like get a lot of stares sometime or just comments that people who, I don't think they mean it in a bad way, but they're like, they're just like microaggressions or I'm like, yeah. Mm, and I'm just like, okay, you know, I, I don't have good enough Italian to try to go talk to you. Or, you're or, to like educate yeah. a whole freaking country on this thing. No. <laughs> so, and I previously, years ago, when I was in undergrad, I studied abroad in Spain in a super tiny town because it was like an immersion program. So mostly everyone just spoke Spanish. And I was already used to that because I got a lot of stares there. Like I was the only black person for who knows how many miles. Yeah. And so I've always maybe growing up in the South of the United States, which is very much always when people talk about the United States, always look to the South as the most racist, which is so funny because it's everywhere. And she does talk about in the book how, you know, different things that happen in the North versus the South. So growing up in the South, I think I've just always been used to those things, which is sad just to be like, yeah, I know, you know, like it's everywhere. But yeah, here, sometimes I'm just like, I don't, at this point, I'm just like, Ugh. Are you looking at me? Because I'm like, okay, keep it moving. <laughs> Do I have something on my face or are you racist? Like, what's the problem? Yeah, like, <laughs> my mask is on, so I don't think you can see anything besides that I am brown. But, yeah, it's, so with the issues, I haven't heard of many issues with the NHS, but I always just think everything is better than the United States because our <laughs> healthcare system or lack of one <laughs> or a lack of affordable <laughs> one is, you know, less than desirable. So with because you, you, we, I just hear, I've heard a lot of things. Obviously, I don't live there. So, what are the like big issues right now? So, I may get political here, but we have a conservative government mm. who are trash, mm. uh, and they, particularly with the pandemic, like it's just a series of events that allow them to do stuff that they shouldn't be doing. <laughs> so, things like um, at the start of the pandemic obviously we wanted to like test more uh, to see like to, to do like track and trace was basically one of the, the biggest things that came up so track and trace is like you download an app on your phone um if you have your bluetooth turned on then everybody around you like and also has who also has the app you can then be alerted if you've been like around someone who may have been di diagnosed with covid who's had like a positive test so basically the app just like flashes red at you and it's like stay in your house <laughs> and you're like oh <laughs> oops <laughs> um <laughs> it's a great fun time welcome to pandemic living um so yeah so that like the test and trace was set up and it was good to begin with because there wasn't that many cases and not many people had the app 
and then the app like you know the cases increased and the more people had the app and that was all great and then it just kind of stopped working very well and that eventually it turned out I think that some sorry my dog's snoring you may be able to (laughs) (laughs) um yeah so he the Conservative government had basically given loads of contracts to people in the private sector that were not like what we would normally see as a British NHS Mm -hmm. contractor. So they were essentially friends of politicians who may not have had any experience in healthcare whatsoever. (laughs) Um, So like million dollar contracts were going to people to give, um, to get like PPE and masks and like protective equipment for the NHS staff. Um, and none of that was arriving in NHS hospitals. So it meant that at some point, like nurses and doctors in emergency rooms dealing with COVID patients had like black, like trash bags on instead of aprons because there was no aprons. You're just like, how, what? <laughs> um, yeah. But also because of the way that the pandemic's been dealt with in the UK, which is like not particularly well from a scientist's perspective, which I think is probably from a public perspective too, um like restrictions weren't brought in fast enough so we had massive waves and then huge amounts of deaths and then everyone was like oh it's over like at the start of summer all of the restrictions went in England so you didn't even have to wear a mask anymore in Scotland you still had to wear a mask but in England you didn't so I live in Scotland my mum lives in England so I would like go down to visit her and go into a supermarket and it was literally just like life was back to pre-pandemic times you're like what (laughs) yeah what are you doing? No. Like, okay. Mm-hmm. And then we'd be the ones wearing masks and everyone would just look at you like you're a complete freak. Like, why you don't have to wear that anymore. And you're like, oh, no, it's a choice. Like I can still do it. You should do that too. Um, but the yeah, the NHS is very much under like huge amounts of strain. So like our government, um, I think it was Sunday night. Yeah, I think it was like Sunday at 8 p.m., something like that. Had a, It was like a recorded press conference online, uh, sorry, on TV. So it was like 8, 8 p.m., BBC One, like the prime channel in the UK. Our prime minister sat down and was like, we're going to deliver this huge booster program so everyone get a third dose of the vaccine. And at the same time as the public found out, the health service found out. So at that point, you had like nurses on their tea break from like the busiest shift of their lives going, wait, what? Huh? Wait, what are you? What are you talking about, boosters? What? Yeah, at least tell them earlier in the day. Give them a like, little bit. Like, to the point where some GP surgeries were like texting patients and being like, "Please do not contact us. We have no vaccines. Like, do don't come to us." <laughs> like, uh. Uh-uh. Um. So yeah, it's not it's not great here. <laughs> like, I've been on a waiting list for surgery on my foot for three years. Like, it's not. This is not easy. So when everyone's like, oh, it's great over here in like so- socialist countries with the healthcare system and stuff, like it's fantastic that we can get stuff for free, mm-hmm. but also it's not entirely free forever. So in Scotland, we get prescriptions free. So if you have a medication that you take, that's free. In England, it's not. You still have to pay for that medication. So it's it'll be free if you're in hospital, like your hospital care would be free at the point of care. But if you need an antidepressant or something, some sort of longer term medication, you've got to pay for that. And it's like, it's heavily subsidized, but it's still like 16 pounds, I think, per prescription or per item per prescription. So if you have like a long term condition, that's that's not free anymore. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's lots of things that like the people think about the NHS that are just not true anymore because wow. our government has just kind of sliced it away and move things away like dental care is not free anymore that kind of thing wow that is oh well let me cross the uk off my list of places to <laughs> scotland's still on it scotland's still good i promise okay. we're good here. good good i was looking at university of dundee um for this you know degree that i'm not getting that I want to, that's not the conversation here, but Scotland's still on the list, people. That is, uh, the whole thing with the PPE is, I remember seeing photos like that too in in the States because they, I talk about this with my friends a lot, but I think the United States 
is too big for like one government because yeah. we have so much with the federal, but then the states have their own thing. And then they were doing, I forgot exactly what they were doing, something like, well, the states have their own thing to do for PPE and the federal, we have this and this is like our, I'm like, what do you mean it's yours? You're not a medical provider. What do you mean it's your PPE? You need to give that yeah. to hospitals. And it was just a mess. But I remember people having to reuse masks and shields and things. And we had in the United States, I don't know if this ever happened in the UK, there were people at the beginning who bought outside of toilet paper, bought so many things like <laughs> hand sanitizer and mask and stuff. They were like, they bought loads of it and then were trying to sell it online and they had to like crack down on not letting people do that. And I was just like, what is wrong with us? What is wrong with people? There's a <laughs> pandemic. And you're like, I bought this pack of masks for $2 or I don't know, $2. I'm going to sell it for 20, like trying to cash off of a pandemic. And I just. It is I wild. Know. Like every time I see something else, I'm just like, how, what, how did uh, the human race get here? Like what is happening? How have we managed to get to a point where this is okay like mm -hmm. i get capitalism but jesus this is like capitalism on steroids like yes it's just gotten worse i just yeah uh, uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> i know so this book is older 2006 oh my god i heard it's so terrifying like, usually i'm like that was only and then i'm like oh no that was more than 10 i mean i don't want to talk about it no, <laughs> no. but with Nigel, please. He's so rude. He's like bumping me as if I'm in his way. Of course. I get you. Sleeping behind oh me. God. My dog's just flipped upside down. <laughs> <laughs> like, Belly so scratches. Me. Belly scratches, please. Yeah. You appear um, to be not giving me attention. How dare you? It's like, what are you trying to do? Talk to someone else? Yeah. Unacceptable. We don't like that. Uh -uh. Um, <laughs> so with the overall in the UK, how is the like overall vaccination rate? I know we're kind of getting on something, but yeah. I think it's, it's I think it's pretty good, but the like the press I don't know whether I'm just being like conspiracy theorist about this, but it feels <laughs> like the press like think it's better than it is. <laughs> like we're amazing. And I don't know how on earth like Germany are dealing with this. And you're like I think ours is like 67% and theirs is 64 or something. And you're like, you're like pretty close. So. Oh, really? Yeah, and they're like, oh, yeah. you know, Europe's going through this huge wave. And you're like, mm-hmm. Yeah. It's coming to us. It's just there's a sea between us. Like, yeah. yeah. That's, Every that's the here it's been, I don't, I remember when the pandemic first started. So my friend who, I don't know why she keeps up with these things, but in December of 2019, she was like, there's a there's something starting in China and I was like be quiet I don't <laughs> I don't want to hear this she was like no it's people are just dropping like flies and then she's like Jana it's it's and it was moved I was like no shut up and so the last thing we did was like end of January I think we went on a trip and then February numbers I think it was starting to happen in Italy but it was really northern Italy and we got we were fortunate being down here on the island of Sicily, but Northern Italy has a really older population and um, a lot. Like, I think it's one of the, I'm not good, but like, you know, with, popu with the population chart or whatever, they have a lot and a higher percentage of older people yeah. in uh, Northern Italy. And so they got hit really hard, but there was some, I don't know if it was like a young kid who created like a tracker for all the COVID cases, like a website. And I was like checking it every day. <laughs> My friends were like, it's just like self help. I, was like, no. I can't. I was like, refresh. And I'm like, oh no. Like, Italy was number one for, like, it would be between like the top number one, two, and three for so long. And I was, I was just like watching it. And then as it started, because it still really wasn't in America. And then it got there. And they only, and now like the numbers are kind of inverse where like America's at the top. But the whole thing with the restrictions, we were put on lockdown so early, like the first week of March and everyone in America was like, doo, doo, doo. and I'm just like, yeah, there's a pandemic. What are y'all doing? And we had then, like videos in, in our press of Italy with like, you know, like people singing or, like across their balconies and stuff yes. and being like, Italy had been in lockdown for so long. And everyone's like, yes. It oh, felt like eternity. They were like, you can't go outside. You can only walk your dog this much. Like it, 
And so I was like, okay, I'm really glad to be here because obviously America's not handling it well, but then Italy is, makes a lot of money from tourism. So yeah. summer came and same thing. It was open, except they did make sure you had to wear a mask, but they opened back up the beaches and all of the things. And then the numbers went back up and then fall, they were like, never mind, I'm gonna shut it back down. So it's just been obviously capitalism because pe people have yeah. to make money is you know one of the main reasons why I'm like, is this ever gonna end? <laughs> Will we ever be free? It doesn't feel like it's ever gonna end. Like I keep saying to my friend, like, is there a way that I can just default on my vaccine and like give it to somebody in a different country? Because mm -hmm. there's the whole issue of like vaccine inequity around the world. Like this is just gonna go on until we've had like, like are you boosted 85 times? Or yeah. Are you just still on the fourth? Like <laughs> they're like your quarterly booster for yeah. COVID. The um in medical apartheid, because she talks about prisoners being experimented on. And of course, yeah. then and now, at least in the United States, I don't know how it is in the UK, because we, of course, have the highest rate of incarceration. <laughs> I love it. And those are most often predominantly black and brown people, especially black and brown men. So of course, even I liked in the book that she when she was giving you the numbers, sometimes at first glance, it might look like, okay, yes, there were 75 white men and 25 black men. However, yeah, black men only make up this, you know, low percentage of the population. So like with the population, it's not equal. But the things with the prisoners, I was just like, I mean, why am I surprised? I know. I don't know why I am, but is in, but is incarceration that big of a, like, do you have a large, I don't, is it, I feel like it's not as big an issue in the UK, but obviously I could be wrong because I don't live there. I feel like it's I feel like it's not as big of an issue, but I think it's still an issue. Yeah. Like it's I can imagine like the the drug issue of incarceration that playing out pretty much exactly the same here. It's just that we have a a less like a lower percentage of yeah. black people in the UK. So the issue probably doesn't look as bad, but I'm guessing if you looked at the numbers of proportionality, it would be like just as bad. Yeah. And then obviously the size of the US compared yeah. to the UK, those numbers. Um, because uh, I hate when I'm like literally talking and then it, the, the thought goes, yeah. I do that all the time. I'm just like, I'm like oh, okay. I'm, I'm, just, I'm, 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 <laughs> I was going somewhere with that point, but I forgot. But oh, do you, have you read of or know anything about any? history of experimentation there with prisoners in the UK at all? So I know it happens or it happened. Um, I don't think it could happen now because we have, so in in the system that I'm in, and I think it's the same across the UK, there's two like layers of ethical approval that you would have to go through. So, or minimum two, two methods. So there's one that is like your university, like institutional ethics. Mm -hmm. And I sit on an ethics committee within the university that I work at. Um, and that's basically just like smaller studies, like less risk. Um, and there's like a group of us that would sit around and be like, that that sounds shady. Like that doesn't sound good. That's weird. Yeah. Like there's a lot of um, studies that come through where I'm like, why are they calling the ethnic minority groups that they're trying to deal with BAME? Let's not do that anymore. Like things like that would we would pick up. Um, there's another then layer if you want to work with NHS staff or patients and that's how you want to access your patient pool and you go through NHS ethics and that's like way more intense I guess mm -hmm. but I think if you wanted access to a prison population now you'd have to do like like the NHS one and another like review because and you'd have to like really defend it because it would just be first off like why are you doing it like what's yeah what's the need um and if it's to if it was something like you're going to try and improve like the health of the prison population, maybe that would make sense. Mm -hmm. But you would need like there would be a whole bunch of stipulations to get yeah. away from that. Like what about um, these people? Yeah. <laughs> yeah why? Why are you? Why are you if it if the if it's so hard to recruit to your study, why are you doing the study? Like yeah. Once hmm. once in the study. <laughs> yeah. Are you trying to poison people? Because if you yeah. are, maybe you should just not like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna need you to go back to the lab and, and work yeah. on that. Um, Cause I think, so obviously now, at least what we know, that's not happening in US prisons, what we know. Um, but oh I think God. she touched on 
you know, once tougher restrictions and things came down and more ethics that they had to take more experimentation abroad. And of course it's to like countries where there's more black and brown people. And I'm like, and I found that I was uh, going back through and like looking at some of my tabs today and listening to someone who was talking about it on YouTube. And I thought that was so relevant with the new COVID variant and how all of these, you know, the US, the UK are banning travel from or travelers from like South Africa and some other countries. And I'm like, but they're the and I um uh, I listened to this podcast called The Read. It's hilarious. And so someone sent in this letter and they were talking, they were actually from Botswana and talking about all they've done, all their government has done and everything, and now how they're being banned because they were like, Oh, we noticed this strain and called it, you know, brought attention to it like they should, and now they're being punished for that. And it's just like, and with the vaccine. I think they touched on in their letter how much the government had to pay for the vaccines. I'm just like, it's wild. Like I didn't know intellectual property or whatever was a thing for a vaccination. Like morally, I I get that you're a business and you want to make money and capitalism and blah, blah, blah. But like, Mm -hmm. there's a literal pandemic happening Mm -hmm. on your doorstep Mm -hmm. in front of you. Like, can you not just maybe put your morals above your bank balance just for once, like one time? Please, just, I was like, this is, you know, copywritten or whatever. I'm like, how, it's a, just, there was a, I think it was a TikTok, a guy did a video and he was like, in a room at, he was like it was he was playing multiple things in the thing but the person's in the room and then he comes in and he's like the kitchen's on fire and it's like we don't have any water and he's like uh well that's too bad like basically like playing like, <laughs> okay. so he's like but you have I'm water so right there yeah and he basically is like okay well this water is going to cost you I'm like okay whatever i'll pay it and he's like can i have the water now it's like oh it's gonna be a while and then like the uk comes over because i think he's the u.s and like oh here you go and they're like I just paid you for, and I was like, <laughs> this should not be funny because it's not funny, but it's so accurate yeah. that it's funny. You have I, to laugh, otherwise we would just cry, like yes. continually until, I don't know, maybe one day it'll be over. <laughs> That's why I've named the pandemic everything, but the pandemic, it's been the personal pan pizza, um, <laughs> the panting pro like, <laughs> Yes, I just need something because I'm just like, how, Obviously, international travel is not stopping. Stopping. Wow. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not stopping. Uh-uh. it's not stopping. Um, obviously, there were well, there was a time when there were way less flights. But like with the way this isn't 100 years ago, like our borders are, you know, they're invisible. We have all this travel. Things need to keep happening for the world to, you know, keep going. So it's like just give, just give them the, the patent. Just... Send them. A, do, you, do you have a Gmail? Just can you? Send, no. I don't know how. I don't know how vaccines work. Is it a Google Bot? Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Not that hard. Like I just don't understand. Yeah. People are just. Oh, yeah, and there's so many people as well in the UK that are like, I don't, I don't want the booster. Like, and that's not even because I'm like anti-vax. It's just because I'm sick of perpetuating this thing. Like, mm-hmm. I, I would rather literally be able to say hey boris like don't give me the booster give it to india yeah. give it to south africa like improve what's happening around us and like i don't know maybe think longer term than like your spell as prime minister I... while oh, i, I don't. just have to for a moment the the hair i i just have to say i'm hair. so sorry i'm so sorry on behalf of our entire nation look we we had the orange Cheeto, so we, you know, yeah. I we don't have any room to. There, no. Room. It's wild. So, like this dude doesn't even brush his hair, and he knows that he's recording for the nation to watch. He just comes. Oh like, he just wakes up. Oh God, he even you just rolled out of bed, like. Sir, I mean, just something. It's literally, it's, like he has a balloon though the whole time. It's like. Like his oh, wife just had a baby, which I understand. That's fine, but he literally looks messier than the baby. I'm like, how? What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing, <laughs> sir? Oh. No one on staff could just give you a brush really quick. Right? Nothing. Uh-uh. 
like does that so for a while i was like maybe he has that disease where it's like untamable hair it was like a thing on like morning like tv segments for a while where it's like this little kid that just had like untamable hair and i was like oh maybe he has that like no there's no excuse for this this is this he knows about it and he's he's going with it oh wow he's like i will be remembered if not for my how i handle the politics <laughs> At least for my hair. <laughs> I, I handled the pandemic worse than probably anybody else in the world. But hey, man, look at my hair. Oh, man. Oh, my God. White men with bad hair ruining countries. Wow. <laughs> it's literally like... What a novel, what a novel theme. And yeah. there's like a whole new, like, I don't know, generation triple zero or something. Who knows? Like they'll be looking at us and being like, "So what was it like when you were growing up?" You know, like it was it was white men with bad hair ruining our lives. Yeah, you're like I'm in I'm in therapy still. Please, yeah. please respect my privacy at this time. <laughs> Ever <laughs> like that's what we should all get. Like so, Trump went out of office. You should all just get like a free course of therapy just to reset you. Yes. Like you know, yeah, they're okay. We're gonna be okay. Come down off the wall. You don't need to be really? so anxious God, anymore. I had my trauma, and then you put him on top. Like please. At least, uh -huh. but they're like, no, nah, that's gonna cost you a couple of thousand. Oh, and then you do you want medication? <laughs> oh, you want? Oh, you want to actually treat it? Okay, cool. Yeah. No. Oh no, no, no. It, mm, that could a whole nother. I fortunately with the military, uh, am under my husband's insurance, so I don't pay for my medication because I do <clears throat> take medication for anxiety and depression. I have a friend who takes one of the same medications that I take, and her she has insurance. She is employed that under a company that is owned by Disney, Disney Corporation, that has billions of dollars. So she should have great insurance. And her copay for her medication is like 200 something dollars a month for something she needs. And I'm like, huh? What do you, no. No. Uh, so. I, oh, the whole it, thing is just like so screwed. Like, yeah. So you get a good job, you get good insurance. And then you have to use the money from that good job to buy medication to be able to continue doing the job well. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Great cycle we got ourselves into. Ooh, capitalism. It's all profits over people. Why they won't share the vaccine and just all of these and so many. I've read so many reports of you know we have a lot of anti-vaxxers in the U.S. Um, so, so many of the vaccines have gone to waste. And like, yeah. so you're not only hoarding the vaccine and the the recipe, that's probably any science person watching this probably like, oh my God, girl, that's not what it's called. They've, they've patented the recipe, man. Like, you know? <laughs> uh, but then you also just have these doses that people in certain communities don't wanna take. Cause you know, you're gonna get a micro trip of 5G and they go to waste and these other countries are like please we will take them i it's just no it, words like I, I know that the uk government has bought booster vaccines like up until i think the last thing i heard was like 2023 that already bought boosters to like cover us and you're like you already placed the order and yet you've just taken away like 20 pounds a week in universal credit to people that need it most what 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 are you talking about? Like, how does this go? The whole thing is just so completely screwed. And then there's this whole thing like about the sort of demonization of ethnic minority communities where they're sort of saying like, look, these are the communities that are anti-vax. And you're like, no, actually most of the communities that are anti-vaxxers are like asshole white people. <laughs> like that are really? in such a privileged position where they don't, they can quite comf comfortably be like, if I don't have the vaccine and I'm ill, like what's the worst that, that can happen? There's a health mm -hmm. service that'll look after me. Um, you know, I have a family that can maybe pay the bills whilst I'm off work, like that kind of thing. And yet the people that are at the front lines of like healthcare, shop workers, delivery workers, they're the ones that are like often a, a poorer socioeconomic state and coincidentally then usually from an ethnic minority background mm -hmm. like they're not the anti-vaxxers they're the ones who are like queuing up outside like in ours in our system at the moment we have a system where you can book 
your booster and then there's also walk-ins that are released every day the walk-in like queue is always out the door like it's not it's not people don't want to get vaccinated it's yeah ugh, it's the people <laughs> like you said the privileged ones who maybe they you know they have the comfort of a job to work from home or aren't working or whatever um because you know same thing in the states those people who or some i've seen like vid videos of people like I'm a nurse and they wanted me to get vaccinated. So I'm quitting my job. Well, well, nice that you could just do that. You no, know, some people can't just walk away from a job like that. And also like, I'm not a nurse. I worked in a hospital um, for a short amount of time and we had to have so many vaccines yeah. just to work there because you're around people who are sick, oh. you know? And so I'm like, why are you, <laughs> why are you surprised? It's so, so strange. Like you've had the hepatitis B and C vaccines yes. like you you have a flu shot every year, like what's suddenly the problem with this one? And then people are, they make up stuff and you're like, you haven't, that's not true. <laughs> like, I did my research, what in your Facebook group? Because <laughs> so much, you know, research, cause even people who like, I'm just like, I know you didn't do any research, okay? Mm -hmm. And it is, I understood at first kind of the hesitancy when people were like, it's so fast, but then learning that it, you know, the basis, because it's like, again, I feel like the school system in America has failed us, but like the basis of the COVID vaccine, I think there was something that started, people had like, there was something online, there was like a picture of like some kind of disinfectant and it said protects against, and it had some, it might've said COVID-19 or whatever, like the basis of the the viruses. And it's like, yes, because it is a virus that has already existed. This is just the yeah. new one. And so that made more sense learning that it was kind of like the code was the original and then they kind of worked with it. But it's like, so if you did any research, you would have come across that and you would have yeah. read how it was possible for them to make a vaccine this quickly. Um, but it's like, but if, you, if you're a baker and you know how to make a shortbread cookie, Mm -hmm. and someone comes to you and they're like can you make me a rum and raisin cookie like i need it tomorrow you're gonna be like mm, i might have to tweak the recipe a bit i need to make sure that it's like perfect and it tastes good and blah 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 but you have the outline of your cookie recipe yeah. like it's not that, that difficult to get your head around you have the foundation the My partner's just come in and like oh. waved at the door. okay bye <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's like, that's where it's going you uh, have the ingredients or at least yeah. you know the basis of something that's in the family, but you have to rework it. You need to finesse it a little for this yeah. audience and for this particular like target. And people do that all the time. Like that is literally how, like if you're, if you're trying to develop a new drug, often you will have a bunch of old drugs and you'll just tweak the molecular structure of them and then put the whole thing through screening and be like, cool, now we found another three that work yeah. because you just tweaked the existing thing that we knew worked. Like it's not, I get that people are worried that it was fast and stuff, but if you just put in like 20 minutes of actual research rather than like sitting on Facebook, mm -hmm. it, helps, man. it really, it helps you. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a wide, there's a lot out there, but you know, and maybe that's a, a privilege of mine having going to college and knowing what a good source is versus, you know, yeah. not one that... <laughs> They would say, uh, no, this is not going to count for your research paper. But I'm just like, I don't, I don't know. But there were, I will say in the States, I did see a bit and my mom was <clears throat> very much one of these people. She is now vaccinated. Thank the Lord. Um, it took a while to get there. But there <laughs> were a group of Black Americans who were hesitant or, you know, against the vaccine because of, again, the history of the institution against black people, which makes sense. And a lot of people I saw were citing the Tuskegee exper experiment, which was one of the main ones that I knew of. Um, but I think a lot of people have it wrong and she explains it in here. She even says like most of the time when people talk about something, the medical, like the government or the medical institution in America have done against black people is the Tuskegee experiment, which was yeah. for those who don't know, I think it started in the 1930s, the US public service, um, it was already kind of established theory that syphilis was more prevalent in black people, of course, um, and that uh, it worked. They had a theory that it worked differently in black bodies versus white people. So they wanted to study it. And so they had a group of I think it was around 600 black men in maybe Alabama who had syphilis, but they signed them up for this stud for a study. Well, they didn't tell them it was a study. They told them they were being treated. 
So people often for bad blood. So they didn't even yeah. know often that they had syphilis. <laughs> They will often think that they gave them syphilis. So they already had it, but they were telling them, oh yeah, we're giving you treatment, but they weren't treating them. They were just watching the disease progress, which is disgusting. And then of course, when they, those who did pass away, they would dissect and study their body. And this is all at a time when there was a, a known cure. I think that's yeah. like the most important thing. Like it wasn't as if they were sitting there and being like, we're going to do like the whole watchful waiting thing that sometimes you get told, like that's you either go for surgery or you go for watchful waiting and see how things progress. Like it wasn't, it was, if you went to a doctor at this point, you would have been given penicillin mm -hmm. and it would have cured you. <laughs> yeah. But instead they were left not even actually knowing that some of them didn't even know that it was syphilis that they had. Cause it was just talked about as, bad blood yeah um, which meant they gave it to their wives they gave it to other sexual partners and there, there was then children that had it that were born with it and you're just like no wonder this was the one thing that comes up time and time again mm -hmm. that this was the thing where it, you're like wow okay no wonder people from yeah. this community are hesitant like of course they are yeah because you're like well i've seen what or heard what they've done in the past. And um, like we said earlier, so many things that I didn't know, like um, reading about the experiments with like plutonium and um, like x-rays and like radiation. Uh, I was like, uh, what are you serious? Yeah. And they were like recent too. It wasn't even like, you know, 1800s or something. It was like, oh, oh my God, like people I know were alive at this point. Mm -hmm. What is, yeah. what? That's when people are like, oh, things are, stop bringing race into it. This is things of the past. It's not. It's like, no. you know, some of these things were ended, sure, but still, even something that ended in 1950 or 1960s, that's not that, you know, that's not 100 years ago. That's no, my, it's not my, long enough my, to go my to parents' about generation. It either. Yeah. And as far as like, we're talking about history, still very relevant. Um, relevant things. And again, my brain lost my thought. <laughs> Darn it. I was like, something, I forgot. <laughs> something poignant. I don't know. <laughs> I, had, I had, I'm like, mm. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. This, there were so, I mean, you could talk about this book for days. Uh, forever. Um, the only, only thing that I was like slightly disappointed about, and I understood it, but well, there was two things. So there was, one was Henrietta Lacks. So she was only given like a paragraph. And I was like, I know. Oh. Give her like a whole book. Well, she has a whole book, but like yeah. more. <laughs> Have you read that book, The Immortal? Yes, yeah, so it's The Immortal okay. Life of Henry Lacks by Rebecca Sklute. Have you read it or no? No, I have it. And someone was like, you need to read that after this one, but maybe, you know, give yourself a break. So I was like, okay, I'll yeah, read it. Give yourself it. a break. Give yes, yourself a break. I, um, it's incredible though. It's not as like heavy as this one. It kind of feels more, obviously it's like emotionally heavy, but it feels more like a nonfiction kind of, what's the word more of like a journey that you're going on like with the author to find out about this like story and what's happened rather than it being mm -hmm. like here's all the most depressing things you could possibly ever read <laughs> in one place yeah. <laughs> like it's yeah but um I after so I read it like I think maybe two years ago and after I'd read it I was like okay so that needs to be on like every college curriculum every even like when you're at school why isn't this in like as a curriculum when you're like 16 like this is that's something that is like totally understandable mm -hmm. come on um for anyone if you don't know Henrietta Lacks her cells were basically stolen from her and she had ovarian cancer at the age of I think it was like 34 she was young really? like really young mm -hmm. um and she was at Johns Hopkins being treated treated um and she died very quickly. It was a very aggressive form of ovarian cancer that she had. And the researchers there stole her cells and put them in culture. So they were the first cell line that was immortal, hence the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks. So her cell lines, her cells have been like to space. They were used in the COVID vaccine development. They were used in, to cure polio. They, they are literally like the format of, like the foundation of, of every medical science discovery you can think of. Um, and her family, weren't told until after things had happened and they were not given compensation at any point so I know that um Rebecca Sklute who wrote that book um helped set up um the Henrietta Lacks Foundation and there's a lot of like 
charity work that goes into that and what happens is people that have been abused by medical research um, without consent particularly can go to the, Hen the Henrietta Lacks Foundation and ask for bursaries and grants and be like hey can you help me pay my college tuition mm -hmm. if you know my dad was in this situation that kind of thing um, and lots of her ancestors have done a ton of work with like the public and telling people about it and stuff and she was only given like one paragraph and I was like but this woman like she the impact of her is just I mean like, well, we're at, literally immortal like it's yeah. so much I haven't even read the book and I still know that it's been so foundational in like everything every yeah. science discovery since then so yeah that I definitely was like oh okay <laughs> just that I think I get it though because like I think I think the other book had maybe it was released before this. So maybe it was like a, look, there's already like a whole history on this. We don't, cause the other book I think is, it's not as chunky as this one. It might be like 350, 400 pages, something like that. Um, but it like to do it justice, you would need at least a book on it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're also, so I, I actually, after I'd read the book, I got in touch with, um, I emailed Rebecca Sklu and was like, I just want to chat like can I talk to you I was just being like cheeky just to see if she would actually reply and her PA responded to me Susan Myers um and she was so lovely because I was like I want to do something like how can I do something for you like for the foundation like mm -hmm. I'm a scientist I need to do something to give back and I ended up making a little pin badge um through my business to sell and it it's a little like very basic illustration of Henrietta and it says thank you Henrietta on the bottom of it and I said to them, look, I want to give, like, send some to the family and I want to um, donate something from every sale. And they're like, oh, that's great. But can you put that in writing? And I was like, yeah, of course. Why? And it was because people have been doing that and basically going to the foundation and being like, can we do something? And you know, put your name on it and say that you endorse it and we'll give a donation. And then they just don't give the donation. And you're like, why are you perpetuating this bullshit? Like... <laughs> What are you doing? Did you listen to the story? Did you not take anything in from wow? I was like, this is this is insane that this is okay. That, like that is because I was kind of shocked when I got that email and I was like, oh, I just want to give you some money. Like, why do you want yeah. this in writing? But like, of course you want it in writing. They're they're putting their name on something. They let me use their logo to say, like, look, they they were happy with it. The family signed off the design. Um, the background was red because they said that Henrietta's favorite color was red. Like, so they had like a, a place in it. And when I'd said like, I want to give you money and they were just like, mm, can you, can you, you know, legally confirm oh. that? I was like, oh my God. But, I mean, that makes sense. That is awesome though. Are they still, was it like limited? Yeah. Do you still have pins? Or? No, I still do them. Um, I didn't want to like, this isn't like a sales pitch. <laughs> um, it was more just like a, look how terrible this is. But yeah, they no, are, no, I still I like that's always so like when you know when you reach out to someone who's like you know more known that's always awesome at least like to get a response and to be able to do something that is I was so excited like I literally got the email back I was like oh my god that <laughs> so hey, they replied to me yeah. yes no that's amazing so I mean if you have like a link or something please give it to yeah, me yeah I can definitely send you yeah of the video because that yeah, yeah the lack of and I mean, so I know what the foundation has her family ever been compensated by the No. So I think the last I heard was I think it was earlier this year. And I'm pretty sure that Johns Hopkins were saying that they might do something. But it's always been like maybe people will do something and then like nothing happens. But I know that a lot of her family as well are kind of uh, they're not like going after money if you know what I mean like they're kind of like we, we just want her to be remembered we just want her to be like honored for for, for her contribution that she didn't even know she was making yeah. and so they don't seem to be maybe like pursuing a massive lawsuit or anything it, it often is like the scientific community that are like geez man someone pay them like yeah do, someone do something rather than the other way around so yeah they seem they do a lot of work with like um yeah medical places and charities and researchers and stuff to kind of like David Lax, who I think is her grandson, mm -hmm. I think. So yeah, so I think that was her daughter's son. Um, I know that he does a lot of work. So they're all kind of active in the different communities that they that they want to be part of. And I know that with the vaccine, they were they were doing some work with that as well to try and get like trust built. 
um that is but awesome. it's sad that like they have to do that and it's not yeah it it's not always like, is... the researchers that are going into communities it's like people who have been abused and you're like oh man it's always the people who shouldn't be doing the legwork the hard work that are and the reason why you know certain things are successful when the people who have the money and the time the resources to hmm well, yeah you know it you know it. it's really every haha ha. i <laughs> i feel hard the um i am a very I, I like to say realist, but let's be real, I'm a pessimist. Um, so I <laughs> just- the world, like you're a realist pessimist. <laughs> yes. And so as I've started reading more nonfiction this year, I like loved it because I love learning as corny as that sounds. Like that's why I'm always on a website looking at a, an advanced degree. And then I remember I don't have any money uh, <laughs> to get one. You're um, <laughs> and so like reading nonfiction has been a way for me to do that. And so and have read so many great ones this year but then also i'm just like wow the world sucks <laughs> and it there's just yeah this is this is just like whenever anyone says like things are getting better and you just like you just give them this in silence like, like read this and then come back to me and then we'll talk like <laughs> hmm, I, even I, this, like so i'd heard of it a couple times and I'd heard Harriet Washington mentioned, but I don't even think she gets as much buzz as like other nonfiction that's probably written by and for white people. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I think even the book itself is like, is subject to racism. Yeah. Because of what it is and, be and because white people don't want to hear what she's writing about because it's so hard to listen to. But at yeah. the same time, it's like we, in a, as a research community at the moment, we're so white it's kind of embarrassing to a point where like i'm doing research on inclusivity and i will go to present at a conference or a webinar or something and we actively have these really awkward conversations as a team beforehand where we all kind of sit there and we go okay so three white people talking about ethnic engagement with health what are we doing <laughs> <laughs> why why are we what uh... But it's hard because the system is so broken that the research community in academia is white because it's built for privileged people. And so yeah. like we have to change the way that health research works for the people that may be involved in it. But we also have to change the whole system of who is doing the health research because we're not even yeah. answering the questions that other communities want us to answer because we're all just sitting here being white. Like, <laughs> Just sitting there in the room being like, I wonder what matters to us. Like, cool. Yeah, and there's, there's a push now to make it so that we are getting out of that. But yeah. it's still like, I've never worked. So I've been in this like industry throughout my PhD and stuff now for about eight years. I've never worked in the same team directly with more than one black person ever. And that black person, I know well, she's a fantastic researcher, but geez, like, she must her inbox must be exploding because people are thinking who can we work with that is black like or who can we work with that yeah. is brown any recommendations one name and she's like yeah. I can't. it's literally it's just her and you're like oh man i don't even want to give you her name anymore give this woman a break like yeah. were there any in your uh phd like cohort or program any other like oh, oh dear. so the unit that I work in was really small, so I, there wasn't like a big cohort of PhD students. It was basically me and there was one girl who was, I think, like a year above me. And then there was a guy who was the year below me. So it was like a tiny, there was a tiny little group. Um, but I think even in our unit of maybe like 70 people, there might be three black faces. Like it's not, it, it's not, it's not, it's not working. Yeah. It's, Yeah. And it's a problem because we, we're all sitting there being like, how can we improve things? And obviously we all have similar ideas because we all have similar life experiences. You know, like, okay, yeah. how do we fix this? Because we're all just coming up with the same shit. Like, <laughs> it, yeah, which obviously we know that nothing's worked because weirdly <laughs> enough. We're all the same. Because yeah. obviously if you had more people, you know, diverse ethnicities in the room, you could, 
you know, maybe learn about something that impacts the community, you know, nothing, know nothing about, or you just have more people to look at a proposal and be like, see, yeah. this is why this isn't going to work, or this is how you yeah. should approach that group of people. So do you think it's really, um, cause I know obviously in the U S college is super expensive and I don't, it's not free in the UK. Is it cheaper though? Then Yeah. It's like yeah. significantly cheaper. So but again, Scotland wins <laughs> because if you are Scottish, you are like, I think it's if you've, if you were, if you've lived in Scotland three years before you start your degree, it's free. Um, so you don't pay fees. You would you would get like a grant or a loan for your living expenses, mm -hmm. uh, but you don't pay fees. But I paid fees because I was an English person going to university in Scotland, but they were still cheap. Like when I went to uni, it was 3,250, I think, a year. Um, and that went up again when the Conservative government came into power. <laughs> um, they, improved, they increased the cap on... Um, uh, what's the word? Fees, <laughs> student fees. Jeez. <laughs> oh, um, and I think now it's like nine thousand and something. But even then, like, it's not a U.S. situation. Yeah, the U. Mm. Oh, my my God, like, I was speaking to someone in my DMs a couple of weeks ago through my like business account, and she's a U.S. based forensic scientist, I think. And she was saying, like, when will she ever pay off her student loans? And I was like, oh, how much is it? Like, just out of interest, like, are you, like, comfortable sharing? And she was like, oh, I think mine's currently sitting at around $110,000. I was like, what? Uh? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And then I checked mine, and, and mine is, I think mine was at, like, £27,000. So maybe, like, fifty, forty five thousand dollars $45,000, something like that. And that's, like, pretty not bad, but like pretty middle of the road for the UK. My boyfriend's oh. already paid his off. Mine are about 50,000. Um, oh my God. And yeah, I know because in the United States, like we have obviously there's public and private universities. And so if you go to one in your state, um, a lot of them have in-state tuition versus out of mm -hmm. state. And so I know people who went out of state who have like over a hundred K and not even like, you know, not ones that have to go to school for a long time, like doctors or lawyers. I mean, just for an undergraduate degree, not even an advanced degree over a hundred K. And it's so, so I know obviously that, and then even if it's lower, that's still a barrier to people getting into university yeah. and, and getting in. Do you think uh, for researchers, the, is money like the main barrier? Do you think it's also maybe it's not a is it not like like a desired path or people just are like I think very it's wide over there. Like, <laughs> so for, so I was the first in like my mum's side of the family to go to university, but it was never like a question. It was always just like, what are you going to study when you're at uni? Mm -hmm. Like that was just the conversation. And then when I finished my undergrad. Um, I just didn't want to like leave school. <laughs> so I was like, I'll do a PhD. Easy. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, but PhDs are also, I was lucky because mine was funded. So the fees were paid um, and I got a stipend to live off, but it wasn't a lot of money. Like it wasn't enough really to live on like comfortably. So I think, I think I got like 14,000 a year in a stipend. Um, but my partner was in a job so he could like help subsidize me a little bit throughout that. But also the academic um, contract cycle is terrible for anybody who does not have like a privileged position to step back on because usually um after you come out of a PhD obviously you go on like the PhD job market and that's soul destroying in itself but you oh my god <laughs> but uh even then like you tend to get like a year's contract or a six-month contract and then you're expected to kind of move around institutions or basically just kind of take what you're given like it's very rare particularly in like medical sciences for you to get a solid permanent contract. Oh. Like, so in the unit, I know, right? So in the unit that I'm based in, there's 75, maybe like 77 staff, something like that. And I think there's four people on a permanent contract. And the rest of us are on temporary contracts that just kind of like, usually they're renewed. Sometimes they're renewed. Mostly they're not like, <laughs> and you're just, it's just like a head screw of how do you, like if you were going to be like if I wanted kids for example you have to like time when you're going to have a kid <laughs> to make sure you're going to have like maternity pay yeah what so, 
four people out of that is absurd and i think that's quite common like i don't think that's that's like a shock obviously it's a shock if you don't know that but it's i don't think that's like a a weird situation to be in um i was kind of lucky in that when i first graduated i had a six month contract and then after that i got an 18 month and then my next one starts in january and that's like 21 months i think oh, and okay. i was like oh that's a good that's a good amount of time and i'm like yeah but you have to start looking for another job at like month six like <laughs> what <Yeah. laughs> this is so does your new one in january is it with a different company or is it the same piece? it's the same so i oh. I'm basically like um, really, really just obvious with my employers to be like, I don't want to leave, right? And my boss is like, okay. Like, I <laughs> yeah, literally said, like, if you if there's no money for me, it's fine. I'll just make the tea. Like, I'll just stand in the kitchen and just make tea for you guys. And you're like, I'm not Ooh. leaving. Yeah, he was Mind basically just like, oh fuck, okay, I'll find, I'll find some money to pay Jesus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I. I just, I've just clung, clung on and everyone, like the people around me that did their PhDs at the same time, no one's in the same place where they did the PhD or where they were often because like PhDs are hard and some supervisors are really bad, but mine was really good. So I was just like, okay, I want to stay here forever. Please don't make me leave. And he just <laughs> looked at me and was like, oh fuck, she means it. Yeah. Let me find some money to pay her, I guess. Find you. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I mean, I'm not in research, obviously, and I, but I know or I've heard of a lot of people in the States who do PhDs, who do research, or like, usually they end up, I don't know, do they do research with the university or maybe they just end up teaching? Is that not a thing? Do Is there just separate, like, businesses? No, it's kind of mixed research? up. So usually you would do your PhD at a university and some universities would expect you to teach throughout that as well. Like some PhD students will get like you kind of earn a little bit extra money if you want to like take a couple of classes, like you can be the tutor or whatever. Um, I didn't just because the unit that I'm based in is a research only unit mostly. There's like three, four, maybe five people that do like regular teaching, but that's because they want to. So I think I teach like two lectures a semester and that's it just because they're the ones that I want to teach and then I don't actually have to like I, it's not in my contract to teach so I'm like I don't need to, I don't want to do that <laughs> bye <laughs> um, so yeah I think um there's like three teaching well there's three tracks in a, in UK universities you're on like teaching you're on research or you're on teaching and research so I'm research only um but again that means that if you're on a teaching track I think you're more likely to get like a permanent contract there's probably going to be loads of people on teaching tracks in the comments being like, no, we're all suffering too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think they're more likely to get permanent. So it means that you're probably going to have people that ha like, like are privileged in a research position. And if, they, um, if they've managed to get to PhD stage and they've managed to get to a point where they're like, okay, now I'm looking for a job, they're probably going to end up going to industry because you can get paid more. It's a permanent contract. There's more stability. So... Mm -hmm why would you then stay in academic research? Yeah. The question we will ask ourselves repeatedly. <laughs> why? 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 <laughs> it, wow. That, ugh. PhDs already sound grueling. And then to, then to market to not be, you know, wide open sounds. They're worse in the US though. They're so much worse in the US. That's like even... my program was three years and you, I had to like write to the university if I wanted a, an extension to four years and that fourth year wouldn't have even been paid. <laughs> so I was like, I'm not doing the fourth year. Oh no. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll get it done in three. I swear I'll get it done in three. <laughs> well, I've seen, and I mean, I guess it varies on, on what, cause I know some PhDs can take a while. Um, but I, oh, again, I lost my thought. Wow. <laughs> It'll come back. <laughs> Something with PhDs and, Mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh just this is not a phd but um since i'm a mess i have looked at every other week i'm like oh you know what i want to be when i grow up and i like, I, like not the time still. I in undergrad i was thinking about going to graduate school um well it's essentially you become a doctor of physical therapy but it's a graduate program for physical therapy um, I think it was three years, but it was like three years nonstop. So like no summer, there's like no time off. And it was like, you cannot work. And I was like, but what, how am I supposed to live and eat 
If I, yeah. it was like, you are not allowed to have a job and you are not able to have a job because you are doing this nonstop. I'm like for three years. And again, that's, you know, another privilege thing. And like, sure, I could have, I was like, but I already have like, it was like 40 something, but with interest now it's like 50 grand. I'm like, I already have this in loan just for my bachelor degree. And now you want me to get into who knows, I have to get the money to pay for the program and then to live for three years. So I was like, no. Absolutely not. It's but, crazy. Yeah. Like, it's just like, how do you expect? And then there's all these universities being like, oh, we don't have a very diverse population of like our higher degrees. And you're like, how do you not know why? Like, yeah. It's, how did you not read like, what you're telling people to pay for? No. What is it's like the every, I swear it's quarterly, at least in the United States, there's always an article of millennials aren't having kids. Why? Huh? No My clue. God. Yeah. Who knew why? <laughs> I don't know. Daycare is more than, you know, U.S. college tuition, but no clue. Maternity leave doesn't make no idea why the kids aren't having kids. I'm just like always confused mm -hmm. at these conversations when they're like, oh, we want to be more diverse. and ha But you're not lowering, you know, you're not making things equitable. You're not yeah, adjusting no, like, barriers. Access for all. Like, it's not. I don't know. It's like when people are like, oh, you know, there's not the, the like, disabilities in science, for example, are like kind of a hot thing right now. And that if you're disabled, if you have a chronic disability, if you're physically disabled, if you have a learning disability, like you're just, you can't, there's no way that you can like work in academic science. There's just, mm -hmm. it's just not, it's not a thing. And then there's all these unis again being like, oh, I don't know why it's so sad. Mm -hmm. I know, let's put a picture of someone with a wheelchair on our prospectus and see if that helps. You're like, no. Oh, no, that's the go-to. They're like, I'm gonna put this one black person and then this, yeah, one person in a wheelchair in here and it's, look, we're welcoming. Yeah. I'm like, okay, Seriously, let me go look at- None of these people actually studied here. They're all models that we had to pay because <laughs> none of them were none of them were here. No. <laughs> and oh. then you're like, ooh, great. The, oh, it, and I need, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never mind, no, no. Yeah, that's, I'm just like, I don't know how these things change when again, the people who have the power to change them, I don't know if they are just ignorant or they're just, or like willfully ignorant, like they're just ignoring it all or they really don't know, but I have to, like they have to know though. They have right? to know. Like I don't, I, they cannot not know. There's so many people that are literally shouting at them. Yeah. Like, like, you, hey, you can put hey. earplugs in from the day you were born or you just don't want to hear it. Like, because. And then I think they look at if there is one person who maybe is disabled or a one a my, an ethnic minority in the room, they're like, "Well, you got here, so yeah. why why could the rest okay. of your family get here?" Exactly. Spread the word to your cousins. And you're and like, put it in the WhatsApp group. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Make a post on your Facebook page so that you like. And I and I hate when people are always like when you talk about race and like disparities and stuff, especially in the United States, they're like, well, look at them. Like there's always exceptions. Do y'all not, did no one go through a basic statistic course? There's always <laughs> no liars. There's always exceptions to the rule every time. Like it, it bothers it's me so, so much. Like, you know, like when you look at, and I'm, I'm not a numbers person. I'm not a STEM person at all. Okay. I was a more history language gal, English. Um, I know it doesn't seem that way, but the way I talk, my, you know, grammar, and I'm, like, <laughs> it's just, I'm like, if you look at like the statistics, uh, cause I read cast in October, August, um, which was talking about, you know, the kind of the racial divide in the United States and the percentage with like the wealth disparities, cause people always are like, well, look at Oprah and look at, you know, these celebrities. And it's like, okay, well, if you take away celebrities, because obviously those people are a super small percentage. And then you have whoever else and it's like, yes, but you are looking at 1% of the population versus this percent. So there obviously is a problem, but it's like, they're like, well, no, no. If that person become a billionaire, so can you. I'm like, well, gosh, no. No. <laughs> no, when they're wrong. <laughs> it's like when people are like, oh, you know, you have the same amount of time in a day as Beyonce. And you're like, no, Beyonce can pay for more hours. Yes. She pays With the her cleaner. house like, manager no. and her chef yeah. and her nanny. And we do yeah. not have the same number of days because she's outsourcing her days. Uh-uh. Yeah. I'm doing it all. My dog is needy, okay? He takes away hours out of my day. <laughs> like, he, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I hate that phrase so much. We all have, no, we don't. It is very uh -uh. different. 
it's wild and even like the the way that um like medical research and stuff views that so mostly <laughs> mostly like in, in the medical research system when you're trying to recruit somebody they do it like during working time because they're working mm -hmm. right and then they get frustrated when they're like no one's coming to see us and you're like yeah they're all at work <laughs> Make exactly. the leap, Sheila. Like, how is this process? Like, <laughs> I stuff like that I will never understand. Or even um, in America, voting, everyone doesn't get the day off, and they're like, "Oh, well, we're gonna be closing the polls." I'm like, some people don't get off till five o'clock, and okay. then they have to drive. Like, again, I oh. know y'all know these things, but y'all yeah. are just being. You're, you're pretending like, why is no one here? Oh no, why did they all show up at the last minute? Because they were at work. It's almost like they had something else going on in their life yeah. at the same time. Maybe, and you were not you know, the black pinnacle of it. Child care. You know, maybe they can't come to your study because they have a kid. You can't bring a kid or like. It's um, everything. Like that is, that's literally like the thing that I do now is kind of questioning people when they're designing trials to be like, okay, what are the barriers at every single point? Like when you when you're trying to recruit is it that you need to provide a crash facility like do all of your participant like population do they all have kids mm -hmm. maybe you need to have like your recruitment place needs to be two steps away from a school so when they drop their kid off in the morning they can then go straight to you and it's not like yeah. a detour or like right the way through to what the intervention itself looks like so the thing that you're testing um does it have pork gelatin in it because if it does you just wiped out like a whole religion of people a whole group of people who are vegan for whatever reason and all of the ways that we're like trying to improve stuff none of it's biological which is also like the thing that comes up in the book all the time like when you have a skeleton you often like how do you tell if it's black or white you mm -hmm. probably can't because like genes are so diverse yeah. like our genetic makeup is a whole big puzzle like you couldn't tell a million things about the gene just because of what the bone looks like like mm -hmm. you don't know that so for us it's it's all the cultural stuff and i think that's what people have missed out before where people have been like oh, actually we just you know we want black people in the room and you're like uh-huh why and like do you want do you want middle class privileged black people that are like you or do you want are you actually looking at class instead or are you you're actually looking at can you hear that like banging noise Mm -hmm. Oh, or slight so, is it his tail? So Bonnie's wagging in his sleep. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh my god, he's oh. wagging in his sleep and he's just banging the floor. Oh, he's just having a good old time. <laughs> <laughs> An idiot. <laughs> <I'm so sorry. laughs> yeah, so it's like it's cultural stuff, it's social stuff, it's um it's probably not ethnicity that you're actually so concerned about. You're just being a judgmental bitch by thinking it's ethnicity. <laughs> like, I mean, facts. You know, facts. At, yes, so many. And I mean, she talks about in the book too, just all these things that they thought were, this is a black disease or things that just predominantly or like affect black people more often. Or and I think one of the most interesting things that I learned from this book was about sickle cell. So yeah. I have always grown up learning about sickle cell. I don't have the trait. I don't have sickle cell, but my, um, I think my sisters are carriers and always, it was always talked about as like, this is only a black people thing. Black people get sickle cell and you know, it's just a curse upon us, whatever. And then obviously there's all these other conditions and things that are uh, worse in black communities. And it's just been for so long, no one has looked at why though. Because yeah. like you said, it's not like we are, I mean, what are we even 99% close to apes or something? So like our difference <laughs> between humans is so small. And so it's like, why would it take so long for people to look at why? Like, do you care about the race? rates like do you actually care because you would look at the racism and all the stress and people and maybe that correlates to why they are higher blood pressure all these things but yeah um because i think in cast she talked about this a little bit too and there was a man who grew up part of his life in maybe nigeria and then he came to america and at the age of 40 or something he was like i have all these health conditions that my father who spent all his time in nigeria never had and like because you know of being black in America, which I just never even thought of the differences. But um, again, I forgot where I was going with this. I really have to stop going off in tangents, 
and I'm really killing myself. I forgot what the original point was when she was, oh, sickle cell. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but in the book, she explains sickle cell is actually, so it's from basically people who your ancestors lived in an area that was uh, hit heavily by basically malaria. And it's like a mutation to protect. So if you have the sickle cell trait or gene, you are going to be basically prevented or like protected from getting malaria. And it's not just black people, it's also like South Asian or like areas where malaria is like a, a big thing. And I was like, what? I've just always been told it was just just like a curse yeah. on you and your family. Uh -uh. Yeah. yeah. And so just always misinformation and, and and stop getting to the reason of like, why is this a thing? Because that would make sense. A lot of Black mm. people have ancestors from the continent of Africa where malaria in a lot of uh, countries is a big thing. So it makes sense over time that their cells would mutate as a, as a protection. But like, they never want to get down to those things or ask the important question. It's just like, oh, oh, we have this problem. We need this. But you're not yeah. like asking, why do we have this problem? And how do we get to this better area? And I just like, besides wonderful people like you, I don't know how we make the changes, except we just need to clone you. So <laughs> yes, please don't. I'm, I'm <laughs> the last one, honestly. <laughs> I will not consent to that. <laughs> Get no, no, no. Uh -oh. no there's oh there's God. so many people like trying to get that into people's heads to be like race is not necessarily what color your skin is like it's mm -hmm. you know, there were white ancestors that were there at the same point as some of black ancestors were like it's not anybody can have sickle cell yes it might uh, impact more black people but that's because there were more black people on the continents of where Mm -hmm. your ancestors came from but it could have been very easily that like somebody in the middle east who had who had a super pale skin tone had that say, trait for sickle cell and then white people now have that trait like and that's where misdiagnosis happens and medical mismanagement and stuff there's a really good book actually that um you should read <laughs> um it's by uh, angela saney so she is she was based in london i think she recently moved to new york and she also so she wrote this book called Superior. It's called the Retur Superior, the Return of Race Science. And it's basically her saying, like, don't judge people on their skin tone because the genetics do not add up. Like, it's not, you cannot tell a genome and look at someone and be like, hmm, brown. Mm, yeah. Black, white, it doesn't <laughs> work. Like it's, mm, yeah. Yes, you might look right at there. it, they might have some ancestors that are potentially Middle Eastern, but you don't know what color their skin is going to be based on that. Yeah. Um, and she also had a book out before that called Inferior that was about um, women and gender issues, basically, and how women are trampled on all the time. Um, she must have a real happy life. She's just doing all this research. It's just like, everything's terrible. <laughs> yeah, doing the research for those books, especially like this, I'm like, ooh, I guess I, I know she, it took her a while, like, you know, yeah. all the interviews and stuff. And I'm like, I would hope you took some time where you're just like, okay, I'm not Take a holiday, are you? Jesus. Because just reading it, I was like, <laughs> I know. I literally I started reading my kids' books in between it. I was like, I'm just going to have a break and go to like Paddington Bear. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I'm watching SpongeBob tonight. This is too <laughs> much. This <laughs> is a lot. It is. Yes, I will definitely have to get those. I'm like, want to read. I just want to read so many nonfiction books. Because especially medical nonfiction is really, really interesting, especially the hist like historical, like histories of things. I just yeah. don't know. All these things. Just like all this time. Just, and like, just not a pandemic. I don't know. <laughs> <gasps> oh my, I can't believe, it's already been an hour and a half and it doesn't feel like that. Um, yeah, not you, sorry. <laughs> no, fine. But uh, I guess in a wrap up, do you have any other, were there any other like big takeaways from this that we didn't touch on? Uh, or? I guess the big things were just like, holy cow, take it as a whole. Like, this is not, like, Tuskegee is, is talked about all the time, like, often, and she says it in the book, I think, explicitly, it's, like, the issues of medical research and participation and stuff, it's often, is, like, or was Tuskegee an issue in your decision-making, rather than it being, like, what contributed to your decision-making? So the questions are never open, it's always, shall we blame this one incident or yeah. not, instead of it being, like, what actually goes into your decision-making? And this whole thing, like, I, I sent my 
um, supervisor who was my PhD supervisor um, a link to the book a couple of weeks, a couple of days ago, and was like, "You need to read this, but don't read it over Christmas." <laughs> no, so this is really good, but not brain-wise, not over Christmas. Not a holiday read. No, <laughs> but it's just, like take the whole thing, like look at it as a whole, and stop being quite so. Obviously, I'm talking to white people here. Something quite so close-minded about the whole thing because we're all kind of looking at each other and being like, why do brown people not come to us? And you're like, mm, this, all of this, this yeah. is why. Read this and then start having different conversations. Yeah. Because it's kind of, it's even changed the way that I've started talking about research because sometimes I'm like, you know, we should make you know, most of the studies that we have at the moment are like overwhelmingly white. So would it be weird if we just had overwhelmingly brown studies to try and balance things out? And now I'm like, geez, that's the worst thing we could possibly do. That's like, I know, let's re-embed racism in the healthcare system. Like, geez, <laughs> <laughs> that is the worst. Don't do that. But it, it just makes, like, it, it makes a researcher's take on what we're doing, like hit home harder. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, I think it's going to be like an annual read to like, make sure everything just keeps going in because it's too, it's too big for me to like well when I read stuff originally I don't like tab it and stuff because I just want to mm -hmm. read it and like digest it um so I'm probably going to do another read in like three months and then retab it but it's going to end up I think that could shape an entire career of how you tackle the problem yeah and there's so many researchers that haven't done that and it's just like mm, you need to do the work before we before we try and like solve a problem that we don't know anything about yeah it's like, that would be like me just trying to hop into research and I have no background. I'm like, I'm here. Hello. <laughs> but at the same time, like we need patients. Like, yeah, um, we have this big push to get patients and stuff in, into rooms with us to be like, actually, that's a stupid idea. Like, why are you asking me to do that? No, because yeah. then they stop the crap research at the very beginning and then we don't yeah. waste all the time and money on it. Very so it is like if you're a member of the public and you're interested, like go to your local uni and be like, hey, can I, is there something that I can do? We have patient panels within our unit that we pay. Um, and sometimes it's like one meeting a month. Like it's not it's not a big workload. It's just like, we just want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. And from that, it tends to be, we, we want you to critique. Like we're open to being told we're being idiots at this point. And we've, we're have we paying you to do that. Like take the privilege and run with it. <laughs> like yeah, go with it. Yeah, that's smart. Um, so it's not, yeah, yeah that's it's more not research. research. It's not just health professionals. It's everyone needs to like look at this and go, oh, okay. Yeah, Let's we all do something about it. change the, so besides having more people read this, because like you said earlier, I think when I looked on Goodreads, because something like cast, um, yeah. I think one of my critiques was for me, it wasn't something wholly new or like I didn't learn a lot from it. But I think we talked about it being an easy entry point into yeah. like maybe reading about race and stuff, but it was like a Oprah book club pick and it's like huge. I think it might have, you know, won the Goodreads, whatever, but this, I think, I don't even know if it had 10,000 like ratings on, yeah. I feel like maybe, maybe it is more people in acad academia or whatever, but it's still like, I'm not an academic and I still think it was accessible. Like reading, it's not like, I mean, it's hard, but it's not like difficult to comprehend yeah. kind of reading. So outside of encouraging more people to read this, you know, the immortal life of Henry and Lacks, what do you think is something that if there's someone who else is in research and wants to make changes, like what's something else they could do or try to like encourage people around them to do to make progress? For me, it's just like, be willing to be wrong. Like, like my, so after George Floyd was murdered, I was already working on this stuff probably like a year before that. Mm -hmm. But then obviously George Floyd happened and then like the world was flooded with like anti-racism reading lists and you know what can you do and donate to this and da, 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 da. And, and I think I kind of I got into that really heavily and I read loads of stuff and I like changed my views on some things and like tried to get rid of like that implicit bias that you don't even really know that you have that subconscious stuff mm -hmm. um, but it was also just like oh this needs to be like a long-term thing it's not you can't just do it once yes. and be done with it like it's a it's a lifetime of on learning things that you've subconsciously had learned. So what you need to do, and like, I'll, I'll be doing this until I die. Like you, you just have to like question everything. And is that view because you're, you actually understand where that view comes from? Or is that view the way that it is because you're actually like have some sort of subconscious shit going on in there? Like, yeah. 
Yeah. And it's the same with like socioeconomic disadvantage and stuff like that comes in all the time. Um, Angela Saini also had like a, I think, it, I think it was on like BBC in the UK, this six part documentary series on eugenics. Mm-hmm. And that was like, that was a tough watch. Um, it was with a guy, Adam, I can't remember his surname, but he's a disability um, rights campaigner in the UK. And they were fantastic. It was such a good series, but it was um, even down to things like when people say, you know, if you can't, if you, you shouldn't have kids, if you can't afford them, mm-hmm. like unpick that because that's actually based on eugenics, like that whole viewpoint, mm-hmm. where, where's it coming from? Is it actually just you being like echoing things that you've heard other people say as you've grown up and you don't actually think like that? So it's just, I've heard, that just made me think of, all that she talked about with like the forced sterilization. I didn't even remember that till you said that. And like women who would just like wake up from procedures, like, oh yeah, we gave you a hysterectomy. Have a good oh, day. Like the woman who didn't even, she didn't even know it until like someone's friend of a friend and a neighbor yeah. told her. I was like, imagine realizing you couldn't have kids and wanting them and finding out from like Bob down the street. Like, mm-hmm. I was like, I mean, again, I don't know why I was shocked, but still, I was like, <laughs> what? Um, yeah, so much. I think with that, I mean, like the booktube community itself or like book turnet was going through a lot of that last year with the book list, like you were talking about. And so it's interesting. I definitely, you know, know people who are doing the work, so to say, like reading different things and having those difficult conversations. But I think it is a lot of people that are like, want just to do one thing and it to be like, well, I read this yeah, and I, I, I'm good now. I put that in my bio, yeah. BLM. So it's done, racism is solved. <laughs> it's like, and it oh. is lifelong, you know, even as, yeah. you know, just in, in all, not even just with like race, just with conversations around disability and like uh, all just different conversations about different groups of people. And, you know, like now it's becoming more talked about with just like gender and all the, all the, all these things, things I have to learn. And it's all, I think people have this concept of what, why I got out of school. I don't, it's like, you yeah. still have to learn things. Things are evolving. We learn more, things are changing and people need to be open. Um, and I don't know how you, I mean, I think there are more people, there are people who are open and maybe just need to be guided in maybe a direction of things to read or listen to or learn or be a part of but i think a lot of people are closed yeah off which is sad so i don't know how think they don't open up until like it might affect them mm-hmm. so with all the abortion stuff that's happening in the states like you know suddenly people are like oh uh, infringements on rights and you're like where have you been like yeah <laughs> this has been happening to everyone but you like yeah <laughs> what is what is going on like it's it's trying to embed like some level of kindness into everything that you do, which just sounds like really twee, but at the same time, it's like having to understand the problem of like the person that you're attempting to judge, like put yourself in their shoes and then just see how you deal with that. Because Mm -hmm. most of the time I just freaking go to bed and have a cry. Like, yeah, (laughs) yes, yes. Where's the chocolate? I need ice cream. It is the, I think so much, especially at least in like, big Western countries that we live in um, is so much on the individual and yeah. not thinking or, you know, have enough compassion or empathy to think about what other people are going through or like take time to be like, okay, I know me and what I identify with, like maybe let me learn about someone else. Um, yeah. And like so, you know, giving yourself the badge of like not being a racist. Yeah. Like that to me was, I think it was Ashley uh, Bookish Realm. She was saying a lot of the time in her videos last year, like, I don't want an ally. I want an accomplice. Like I want yes. I want someone to come and like screw things up with me and not be scared of that. Mm-hmm. And I think for me, like we were talking, there was a, a race strategy meeting. What a word. Um, <laughs> at our institution a couple of weeks ago and I went along to it and I was like, mm, okay, a lot of us are white here. Like this is, mm, this is kind of twee and what's going on. And the whole way through it, like someone had said, how do you demonstrate good allyship? And I was like, you you don't crown yourself an ally. Like, you're not. I do not have the authority for someone to say, or for me to say, I'm actually not racist. I'm actually not sexist. Because there's so much that, like, other people in the, in those groups will see in my behavior that I don't see yet. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, no, you're not. You're not not racist. 
you still have some undone behaviors like yeah. deal with yourself stop yeah. giving it like stop congratulating yourself because it's not it's not helping anyone they're like here's my anti-racist pin yes. and i'm a feminist <laughs> pin and I'm just like you're like what just, no 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 oh, yeah i love when <laughs> ashley says that yeah you're like i want someone here you know that is getting yeah like into it with me and not just like putting that in your bio or like this profile is safe for okay <laughs> like yeah, more than just your social media presence yeah and Not like being really. those white people that are at protests that are the line between mm -hmm. the groups that are protesting and the police yes like you be you be that line and if you're not willing to be that line then get out of the conversation because you yeah. haven't done enough reading yeah be in front of me for yeah sure. and i like we said earlier i definitely think a lot of the younger folks um give us hope but yeah. huh, some people hmm. old people are not dying quick enough yeah it's like, <laughs> get out of here please so make old. room <laughs> so I, many guys like i i know that life expectancy is going up in a lot of places but geez man like these people are hanging on look some of these politicians in america i'm like this is absurd yeah and especially with these lifetime appointments y'all need to go yeah <laughs> The yeah. lifetime appointment thing, what are you talking about? These people could just be like pissing themselves as we speak. They're just like clinging on for dear life. They're like, no, yeah. I'm not giving up my seat. I'm not giving up because I, I really, really hate you. You're like, fantastic. Great. You're useful. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your contributions. Thank you for your excellent service. Um, uh, so yeah. much. I feel like, I mean, this has been a lovely chat and I feel like we could keep going, but I guess we can end. We should here. wrap up. <laughs> um, but I would love to do this again. So thank you so much for joining me. And I'll have uh, a link to your podcast. Heidi does have a podcast. Mm -hmm. And to the pins down below and any of the books that we mentioned. But thank you again so much for joining me in this chat. Everyone, please, especially if you're going into the medical field, research field, please read this book. Okay. but Don't put it off like I did for like <laughs> 10 years. Just read the thing. Yes. Don't <laughs> just get it. But wait, not... Don't read it. Not over Christmas. Be nice to yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Enjoy your holidays. I read this too. <laughs> read some romance and then read this <laughs> after Christmas. But that's it. So you know what I say? Stay blessed, hydrated, moisturized, and sunscreened. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.